Originally, I trained to be a child psychologist. When you're a child psychologist, you always have three patients, mother, father, child, and it's quite hard. So I ended up living in Los Angeles teaching aerobics. For Jane Fonda, obviously, was a very high-end studio full of Hollywood producers and actresses and actors and singers, but they were all obsessed with what they looked like. It really interested me even then that, that people who had everything, the highest success, didn't actually ever feel good about themselves. They were under tremendous pressure too. So I I trained in hypnotherapy with the idea of simply working with people that had eating disorders but very quickly I started to work with people that had every kind of disorder and it was really fascinating how hypnosis will activate what it is that stops people being confident or stops them being the way they want to be and I had so much success in that and that kind of led me on to working behind the scenes on lots and lots of television shows and then I actually started to work in front of the camera on quite a lot of television shows and then I wrote several books Books and got my own column in several magazines and newspapers and lectured all over the world. Confidence is really what you feel about yourself. You can all put on the bravado and go, I'm the greatest, I'm the best. But if you don't really believe that inside, it's kind of fake. So you might be able to blag your way through certain things. But when you have real confidence, the difference is you like yourself. You like who you are. You're not arrogant. Your life isn't perfect. But when you really and truly like yourself, your life is much, much, much happier. And the other thing about confidence, you don't have the internal voice going, oh my God, you fucked that up. Or, oh, you did that wrong or you're such an idiot, you stop all that and you're actually nice to yourself. <laughs> Most of the people I work with on confidence want to be confident enough to ask for a pay rise, to get a better job, to go for an interview and to come across as the best person in the room. They want confidence to speak in public, to give a sales. But a lot of my clients yeah. who say, I want to lose weight, but all my friends go out for pizza and they can't say, oh, excuse me, waiter, I, I don't want a pizza, I just want a salad because they haven't got the confidence to draw attention to themselves and say, I don't want that. They can't say when everyone's ordering fish and chips, I just have fish without the batter on. And because you have to actually like yourself enough to say, I don't eat that kind of rubbish. Can you get me something else? And a lot of people just can't do that because they feel uncomfortable asking for different things. They feel uncomfortable sending food back. I mean, one of the things I do in my book is show people even how to get a discount because when you like yourself, it's amazing what you can do. You can get money off, you can get upgraded because you approach all of that with a very different air which is not arrogance it's a kind of quiet self-esteem that makes people like you and want to do things for you so a client would come to me and go oh I'm not confident I couldn't possibly you know put myself forward I worked with somebody years ago said I want to be a famous actor that's all I've wanted to do but I could never get an agent I could never go for auditions and, and I could never put myself on stage so clearly that was a great problem if you wanted to be an actor so when somebody comes in and says I'm not confident I've never been confident I don't know how to ask someone on a date. I don't know how to ask my boss for raise because I'm not confident and I'm never being confident. That's not true. You will never find an unconfident baby. If you take your baby home from hospital and shut it in a room, you can guarantee it's going to scream for hours because the baby's belief is I'm here, I'm gorgeous, someone's going to come and feed me even if it's three in the morning because I deserve it. And all babies are born with incredible confidence. You know, you try telling a two-year-old they can't have an ice cream, they don't go, oh, okay, they ask you eight, nine, ten times times because they have a belief that says if I ask I'll get it if I keep going I'll get what I want we're all born with that unfortunately life experience for many people tend to diminish it so what hypnosis does it will take you right back to the time where the innate confidence that you were born with started to diminish and it will show you what happened some people going I've never had confidence they go oh I see right when I was two or three or four that happened and that made me feel that I shouldn't be confident and once they've accessed that information, they can never again say, it's just me, I can't help it. So they go, oh yeah, I see, that happened, but now that's not me, and I can be confident all over again. Hypnosis is great, because it shows you the little kind of journey you went on and where your confidence went, but it also shows you how to get it back and keep it forever. For instance, you're reading in school and you want to read the word stomach, and you say stomach, and all the kids laugh at you, and then you think, I'm never going to speak in public again. The number one thing people want is to be comfortable with others, to be able to speak, to be able to give presentations. But for a lot of people, it's actually just going out on a date.
date, being around people, not feeling inadequate. So that the number one things are getting away from this feeling of being inadequate, not putting yourself down and being comfortable talking to all kinds of people. Because how the brain works, I mean, people think the brain is complicated. It's not. Your brain's number one job is to find out what causes you pain and then make sure you never, ever, ever go through that pain again. If you have to read in class and you try to read the word soiled and you say solid because you're nervous and all the kids laugh at you and you go bright red and they laugh at you a bit more, your brain searches what's caused this pain, speaking in public, drawing attention to yourself. And then it goes, right, well, my job is to make sure you don't experience pain. So you're never going to speak in public again. You're never going to draw attention to yourself. And if you try to, I'm going to give you a massive panic attack and that way you won't experience pain. So the brain does what it thinks you want, but of course it's not what you want at all. And so many people who want to speak in public just can't because they've had these negative experiences in their past. And it's very easy to get rid of them once you access that. Your brain always does what it thinks you want, but it's usually acting on information that is years and years old and is completely irrelevant. There's two things you can do that I promise will change your life. One is stop criticizing yourself. If you just imagined you're walking around with a little tape recorder listening to yourself, and the minute you get up, you look at them and go, oh God, I look terrible today. I look awful. This app looks horrible on me. I've gained weight. And then they go to work and go, oh God, I forgot to charge the phone. I'm such an idiot. Then they come home and go, oh, I've ruined that thing now. I put too much salt in it. And if you imagine, if you spoke to your best friend like that, you look awful in the outfit. You're a complete idiot because you forgot to charge your phone. You've ruined the thing you're cooking. You're never going to get there on time. You're a twit because you came out without the map. If you spoke to your friend like that, they wouldn't be your friend for very long. I mean, I like my friend. I would never say to her, you're such a stupid cow, because I like her. And if I wouldn't say that to my friend, why would I say that to myself? Be your own friend. Listen to how you talk to yourself. And then just change it. Instead of saying, I'm such a moron because I went out with that direction, go, yeah, I did. I went out with that direction. But I won't do that again. Next time I'll remember. And if you go out that the address, instead of going, God, I forgot the address. What an idiot. It's, good. it's okay. I'll call them. They'll give me the address. So stop this negative criticism because the problem with the mind is that while it will screen out to a degree criticism that comes from other people, what you say to yourself, your mind believes without question. And the most important words you'll ever hear are the words you say to yourself, but you have great power to change them. That is the most important thing to stop this criticism and to stop this negative voice in your head. Like when my daughter comes home because she's forgotten something, I always say, what have you remembered? I never say, what have you forgotten? I've remembered something, not I've forgotten something. So like yourself, treat yourself the way you treat your best friend. Be nice to yourself. We're designed to change habits. It's very easy to change habits. When people say, I can't change, that's so wrong. We are designed to change. Make a mental note or even a real note. Write down on your phone or in your notebook how many times you call yourself names every day and then change that. So if you call yourself a bloody idiot or a moron, stop it. Just say to yourself, I'm a human being. I'm allowed to make mistakes. A person who never made a mistake never made anything. And how you learn is from making mistakes. So when you make a mistake, go, I learned from that. That's a learning curve. I won't do that again, rather than calling yourself names. It won't stop forever. You're still going to call yourself names. When you do, just go, that's not true. I'm not that. I'm just forgetful. Years ago, my daughter must have been a therapist's daughter because I went to pick her up from school when she was about six and her teacher went, oh my God, I've just been put in my place by a six-year-old because I said to her, oh, your mother's hopeless. And she went, my mum is not hopeless. She's just late. You're not your behaviour. You can be late, but you're not that. You're just late. So instead of going, oh God, I'm hopeless. You go, no, I'm not hopeless. I'm late. I'm not stupid. I just dropped something. So it's the same thing. Don't give yourself these labels, hopeless, idiotic, moron. Instead, say forgetful or a little bit late. Your body has to match your thinking. It's never going to be the other way around. You have to act in a way that absolutely matches your thinking. So when you say, I'm clumsy, I'm forgetful, I'm clumsy, I'm forgetful, you can guarantee you become clumsy clumsy and forgetful. If you say I've got a fantastic memory, I remember everything very quickly, that will actually become the case. You may wake up believing that you feel terrible, but that's because you keep telling yourself that you're terrible. If you wake up then I'm shattered, I'm exhausted, then that's how you feel. If you go, yeah, I'm a little bit tired, but I'll be wide awake in 10 minutes. What you say becomes what you are. The way you are is only down to two things, and they are the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. So when you say, I'm exhausted and I'm shattered. 
that's a very, very powerful picture and a very powerful word. And you have to respond to that. When you go, I'm mildly tired, but I'll be wide awake in 15 minutes. It's a very different image that you respond to. So you have a huge responsibility to be aware of the pictures and words you're making. And when you change them, literally it will change your life. Physical exercise makes you feel great because when you exercise by nature, you start being nice to yourself. You think, oh, this is good. I'm doing this. I can do more sit-ups this week than I did last week. So by nature, any exercise that you're doing tends to make you be nicer to yourself. We're all designed to run and jump and leap. But if you exercise and hate it, that really does doesn't work so you've got to do an exercise that you love and you don't have to do it every day but every other day is good you shouldn't be doing that 90 minutes of hard slog that you hate skipping for 10 minutes on a trampoline is better for you than going for an hour run because you're protecting your joints it's not going to exhaust you and you'll enjoy it more don't criticize yourself is number one and don't let in negative criticism from other people is number two one of the most important things is not to let negative criticism in so when someone says to you you look dreadful in that what you should say is oh thanks for sharing but you don't have to let that in very happy people by nature are benevolent and very miserable people are quite critical so when people are happy they don't say mean things when people are unhappy it's like a pecking order a miserable person wants you to be miserable then they feel equal so they will often say things to put you down and it's very important to not let that in so if someone says something really mean or spiteful or cruel you can either say to them gosh you don't like yourself very much do you or you must be having a really bad day to be like this say to them you know what critical people have the most criticism reserved for themselves and I've sort of realized that everything you say to me is actually what you feel about you and if you keep telling them oh you're showing me again how to say satisfied you are with you believe me they very quickly stop because they know that you've got it because that's what critical people are the person they are most unhappy with is themselves and they reflect that out not in so just saying to them you're very unhappy with yourself you're showing me how dissatisfied you are with you makes them stop and think or you can just say, thanks for sharing. Luckily, I don't agree with you. And you see, you're not letting it in. And if it's your boss and it's not appropriate to say, thanks for sharing, but I don't agree with you, just decide, I'm not going to let that in. It's not true. They're having a bad day. And just let it go. I love this story about someone who went to see a holy man and was saying to him, you know, everything you say is rubbish. It's all bogus. It's all stupid. And he continued to smile and beam and smile and beam. And this poor journalist who wanted to diminish him got more and more exhausted finally said I don't understand I'm criticizing you why are you smiling and he went well you see if you try to give me a gift and I don't accept it who's got the gift and he went me well exactly I don't accept these comments and that's the truth if someone's trying to give you something and you don't accept it they haven't given it to you so people can say very mean unkind harsh things but you don't have to let them in because it's usually about them and you just have to deflect that and not let it in just be aware, you know, don't let it in. You don't have to let anything in unless you choose to. So if you want a reduction on a price, you must never ask a question that someone can say no to. So you don't say, can I have a discount? Because they say no. You don't say, can you reduce this? Because they say no. You say, what's the best price you can give me on this? You have to always ask people a question they can't say no to. How much are you going to take off for this? What are you going to give me in addition when I buy this? And if they go, well, we can't reduce it, go, that's fine. But what can you give me? Can you give me an extended warranty? You kind of ask people questions that they have to say yes to. It takes self-esteem to do that, but when you do it the first time, you probably feel really nervous and worried, but when they actually do it, you think, wow, that worked, and then you feel more comfortable doing it again and again and again. It's like guys asking girls out first time, it's really nerve-wracking, but they say yes, they think, oh good, they said yes, I'll ask another girl out, and it becomes easy because the more you do it, the easier it is, the easier it is, the more you do it. But don't ask questions that people can say no to. So if you want a pay rise and you say to your boss, you know, I've been looking at what someone doing my job for this amount of years gets paid and, and I don't get paid that. So what can I do to get that pay? They can't say no to that. And even if they say, look, we actually got, we can't pay you this much at the moment, go, that's okay. What can you do? Can you give me extra holidays? Can you give me perks? Ask a question in a different way. Because when you stop hearing the word no, it grows your confidence again because you're learning great negotiating skills, which start by never asking a question that someone can say no to.
you. Every time you get up, I want you to say out loud, I am enough. Say it when you clean your teeth, say it when you're in the shower, because if you link that to teeth cleaning and showering when there's nothing else you can do, you say it all the time. The number one reason people have issues is they don't feel enough. They don't feel pretty enough, smart enough, talented enough, rich enough. As we get older, we do that. Oh, I've got cellulite. I'm not size six. I haven't got a designer wardrobe, therefore I'm not enough. And that isn't true. So every day, say many times, I am enough. And very quickly, you'll start to feel that. And then when you say to yourself things like, yeah, but I'm not enough because I don't earn X amount. You just go, well, that's true, but I'm still enough. I haven't got a designer wardrobe. I'm still enough. I haven't got a posh car. I'm still enough. You sort of run out of objections. Then your mind goes, you know what? You say this so much. It must be true. And then it lets it in. But keep doing it even after you've let it in. Say it 10 times in the morning and 10 times at night. And that's fine. That's all you have to do. And if you're going for an interview or going on an important date or about to meet someone really hot, just keep saying again, I'm enough. I'm enough. I'm enough. Because when you know that you're enough, nobody can ever make you feel less than them. That is the most important thing in the world to know that you're enough. And we all are enough, more than enough. The reason why I'm enough is so powerful is that, you know, any psychiatrist will tell you that the common denominator of people's emotional issues come from not feeling enough. If you came in with your problem and it's like an onion and you're peeling away the layers of, you know, I don't feel pretty enough, I keep eating cake and cookies, I don't ever get to go to the gym or I don't ever seem to reach my potential. Whatever problems people come in with, the real crux of all their problems is they don't feel enough. They don't think they're good enough or lovable enough or smart enough or interesting enough. That is a modern problem we have that most people don't feel enough. And if you look at Marilyn Monroe or Princess Diana or Amy Winehouse or Philip Seymour Hoffman and so many people who had everything, what they also had was this belief that I'm not enough. Michael Jackson was the same. We see so many people who have everything. We see so many people who are beautiful and depressed. You can look at Britney Spears when she started to shave off all her hair. You can look at people in the music business and see, oh, there's something not quite right here because when you go into that world you always have to be thinner prettier better and they start to have surgery because they want to be something else it's a great shame that we're teaching the generation of women that natural breasts and natural butt that's not good enough and they've got to look ridiculously high and round we look at people like Nicki Minaj and think well that's normal and it's a great shame that we're bringing up a whole generation of girls who think that they're not enough just the way they are I really blame the media for that and of course now men are getting that too because they look at guys with six packs and the way around that is to say every day I'm enough I always have been the day I was born I was enough and I'll be enough right up until the day I'm no longer on the planet I'm enough and I always have been I always will be when people want to find love they start to try and change their outfits they go on a diet they buy nicer clothes they get their hair done they get their nails done I'm talking about women but men are the same they try also to buy a new outfit and to turn up in a nice a car even if just leased it because we're saying look I've got all this stuff this great body so therefore I must be enough but when you know you're enough when you can say every day I am enough yes I've got cellulite I'm still enough sure I could be 10 pounds lighter I'm still enough I don't have a nice car I'm still enough your brain will never argue with that when you start to go yeah I'm a goddess I'm a rock star your brain goes I'm not really a goddess you're not really a rock star because you're driving around in this little crappy rented car when you say I'm enough it's so true that your mind will never ever ever object to it and once you know that you're enough and it doesn't take long to know it everyone around will also know that you're enough so when you elevate your own value everyone around you also elevates their value when you increase your own sense of self-worth self-value and self-image everyone around you will start to also increase their sense of what you're worth but you see a lot of people are very arrogant because they're trying to persuade everyone everyone that there's something. That's the other end of the scale of insecurity. You don't have to convince anyone except yourself. I'm a great believer in putting I'm enough on your phone alert so it pings every morning at 8 o'clock and 8 o'clock at night says I'm enough. Write it on your mirror in huge lipstick letters. Put it on your screensaver and say it to yourself. I'm a great believer that when you're cleaning your teeth or having a shower, that's the time when you go, I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough. Because what else are you going to do when you're in the shower? You know, that's 
that's a good time to link in a behavior. And as you start to say it, your mind will start to very, very quickly believe it. And then you will start to feel it. So it's really important to tell yourself that you're enough on a regular basis so that your mind really, really gets it and lets it in. And then you can have anything you want, but it really starts with knowing that you're enough. And if you don't know you're enough, no one else will know it. And if you want love, you know, the thing you have to believe is that you're lovable. We Getting a new outfit to believe you're lovable is very superficial, but saying, I'm enough, I'm lovable, I'm great, will make the person you're dating also believe that. And, and in a professional capacity, if you say that at work, your colleague, your boss, your clients, your customers also start to believe that too. But until you believe that you're enough, no one else is going to believe it if you don't believe it. You know, Muhammad Ali, he was the best example of that ever. He said, you know what? I said I was the greatest before I even knew I was. And then, wow, something really weird happened. He became the greatest. He would go into the ring going, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, because he wanted really to defeat his opponents, but because he said it so much. And he never said it with arrogance. He said it in an interesting way that made us all love him for it. And no one said, wow, that Muhammad Ali is arrogant. Went, no, he's the greatest. That's what he is. He said it, and we believed it. And it's very important that we understand that what we say about ourselves is an energy and the energy goes out into the world and people match and return what you think about you. Of course, you know, there's that arrogance of I'm brilliant me, I'm great me, but we know that it's not real and so we don't believe that. And then we get other people who are very self-effacing and modest, but what you really believe about yourself to be true, people will pick up. That's good news. But the other good news is that you can choose every day what to believe about yourself and why would you ever think you're not enough. There isn't a baby on the planet who isn't born knowing they're enough. So you've got to tell yourself you're enough. And because you came onto the planet with that belief, all you're doing is reactivating and regenerating something you were born with anyway. It's not nothing unusual, just getting back something that really is your birthright. Your mind will never disagree with the fact that you're enough. First of all, because when you were born with knowing that, you know, if you took a baby home and shoved it in a cupboard, it will cry for days because it's in a belief is someone is going to come and attend to my needs because I deserve it and I'm worth it. Of course, it's a bit like if you bring home a puppy or a kitten, they'll bound up to you and go, if I'm here, cutest thing and you are going to attend to my needs. Because if you kick that puppy enough, it will start to run off and hide behind the fridge and think, oh, maybe I'm not enough because no one here likes me. That must be my fault. Very much like humans. But we all start off knowing that we're enough. And so repeating that every day is such an easy thing because your mind will never object to it. It will never argue with it or never resist it and no one else will ever go no you're not enough but the other great thing is it's not a competitive thing you're not saying i'm enough but they're not what you're saying is i'm equal to everyone in the world and everyone is equal to me so i can go to my boss and ask for promotion because i'm good enough i can go to my boss and instead of begging and pleading for pay rise, i was like go look you know i'm putting in these hours i'm doing this and i really deserve it and i'm worth it because when you elevate your sense of self worth and it's real it's genuine it's authentic people around you really get that thing of yeah you are worth it and you do deserve it when people are stuck in a job they don't like and they're not getting the salary they think they should get, they usually have an inner belief which is, I'm not worth more, I don't deserve more, I can't ask for more. And it's always interesting to find out where does that come from? Where did you ever get that belief that you're not good enough, smart enough, pretty enough? You know, usually it's come from someone else. It's very rarely come from you. And so I tend to go back and have a look at that because all babies come on the planet with the same belief. I'm here, I'm gorgeous, someone's going to come and pay for my need. If you're stuck in a relationship, relationship that isn't working for you, if you're stuck in a career that isn't making your heart sing, if you haven't got what you want, it's because you're dialoguing with yourself very bad. Some people will say things like, my job's a nightmare, my career is stressing out, this paperwork is driving me up the wall, or these kids are making me insane. You're telling your mind you don't want what you've got. Or for instance, if you want to have your own business and you say, well, I really want that, but you know, I'm going to have to put in all these hours, there's no sick pay, there's no holiday pay, I've got to work weekend. 
things. When you tell your mind that what you want is going to cause you pain, it will do everything to stop you getting it. So the way around that is you've got to say, I want it. I've chosen it. I want to put in the hours. I want to be up all night with a brand new baby having no sleep. The minute you can get your brain to not only see that you want it, but to link pleasure to it. If you look at how athletes work, athletes never go, yeah, I'm training the Olympics. Oh, it's so boring. Or yeah, I'm training for the Olympics. It's so hard. It's so tough. I can't go out drinking with my friends. They have to tell their mind, I want it, want it, want it, want it, want it. And if you study any athletes, they're very disciplined, but they don't bitch and moan. They, they say, no, I like it. I love training. I like having this clean diet. I enjoy it. I love performing. They never got, oh my God, you know, going out stadium to crowds is terrifying. They have to tell themselves better things. And of course, I work with a lot of Olympic athletes and royalty and rock stars. The ones that make it do the same thing. They constantly tell themselves, I want this. I've chosen this. This makes me feel good. I like putting in the hours. I like what I have to do. It makes me happy. Because your brain's job is to come up with resistance to anything you tell it you don't want to do. And when you go, I want it, in the same way that junkies go, I want to stick a needle in my arm. They don't go, oh, it might hurt me. They link pleasure to it. And you get to choose every day what to link pleasure to. And you have to learn to link pleasure to where you want to go. Because if you link pain to it, you're not going to get there. Your brain believes everything you tell it. Your brain doesn't care if what you tell it is right or wrong, good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. It believes it. So you might as well tell it great things. If you put your hand up to your mouth and go, I'm eating a lemon, I'm eating a lemon, I'm eating a lemon, you can make your mind believe you're eating a lemon. If you can make your mind believe you're eating a lemon just by the words you say, then you realize you have a choice every day. Use amazing words and get amazing results or use negative words and get negative results. And when you have a brilliant brain, which everyone has, you have a choice. Rationalize why you feel so terrible or talk yourself out of it. It's much better. Talk yourself out of it. I want it and I'm prepared to do whatever it takes. I'm even going to enjoy it. And then you'll enjoy it. We have choices every minute of every day. And you've got to make the right choices. I studied the way the brain works for nearly 30 years and I realized a long time ago that the brain likes what is familiar. We haven't changed that much from being in a tribe and in a tribe what made you safe was familiar. The same people, the same food, the same area. You didn't really wander off outside of your tribe. You didn't invite strange people into the tribe. You didn't eat food that you didn't recognize. And so our brain to this day is actually programmed to reject what is not familiar. And people don't understand that what you mean my brain is really going to reject success oh yeah you're not used to it in the very same way that some women who have a father that puts them down or diminishes them or doesn't give them attention then they meet a guy that does the same thing and it's familiar the brain goes oh i recognize this i know how to deal with this i'm used to this when they meet a nice guy that praises them and pays the bills they go oh, he was too good for me no one can be too good for you what you're saying is his behavior was so unfamiliar it was so alien i rejected it and went back to what i knew and so if you come from a family where no one's worked or no one's had money. Lottery winners, interesting enough, who come from poverty will get rid of all that money because investing is so unfamiliar. What's familiar is spending what you've got till it runs out because you never had enough. But when they get a lot, like billions, they just spend it the way they spend a hundred dollars. They just buy stuff without thinking about it. And so our brain really is wired to reject anything that's unfamiliar. And it prefers what is familiar. You know, I used to do makeup over shows with women who were fat we'd give them a trainer dietitian exercise we'd make them look amazing and when the cameras stop rolling they take all the makeup put on their tracksuit and order a pizza the thing about the familiar unfamiliar is your brain loves what is familiar that's the truth but you can make anything familiar if you get up and run every day it becomes familiar you take sugar out of your tea and stop eating desserts for long enough it becomes familiar you start dating someone who's nice to you or you get used to working at weekends on your business it becomes familiar so the truth is your brain tries to go back to what is familiar it doesn't like what is unfamiliar that's true but it is your job if you want to be have a successful relationship if you want to have a successful body where you eat well and work out if you want success in your career in your love life your relationship because if you've got to make what is unfamiliar familiar praise yourself that's a great thing
wanting to make familiar. And look at what you want in your life and decide to make it familiar starting right now. Praise yourself, tell yourself you're good, believe that you're ambitious and dedicated. And any familiar stuff that you don't like, like procrastinating, putting yourself down, oh, it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's too boring, make that unfamiliar. You can choose every day. And there isn't that much difference in people who are really successful and who aren't, except for the ones who are successful, they take full responsibility every day for the pictures they make in their head, for the words they say to themselves. And they make positive stuff familiar. And eventually, anything that you do enough, it stops being what you do and it becomes who you are. So many of us never allow it to become who we are. We think it's work and so we just give up. Instead of realizing that if you do something enough, you start to love it. It's like running. It's like going to the gym. First it's boring, then it's hard. But if you keep going, you eventually start to love it. Pick one area. Look at something in your life that's familiar and just start to work and I'm going to make that unfamiliar and I'm going to make opposite of that familiar and take on an athlete's attitude to it so it becomes easier and it absolutely will work but you have to stick at it you know if you have tea with four sugars and you take those four sugars out it tastes horrible but then after a few weeks you think oh my god did I really drink that every day it's disgusting because anything that you do becomes familiar and anything you stop becomes unfamiliar but the biggest thing to make familiar is praising yourself and the biggest thing to make unfamiliar is criticizing yourself, diminishing yourself. My general philosophy is that the old method of therapy is really, really ineffective. It doesn't serve people to go and have an hour of therapy with a therapist every week for months and months and months. I believe in curing people in the room. So my philosophy is you can fix someone in an hour. An hour is plenty of time to find out what's wrong with someone and to cure them. Because really the things that make us unhappy are that we're thinking the wrong thoughts. We, we have beliefs that are very outdated. And of course, as children, we learn what we live. So if you live with people who aren't good to you or make you feel that you're not good enough or you don't deserve love or you've got to work hard to get love or you're not smart enough, cute enough, interesting enough. Once you buy into that as a child and as a child you don't have any choice because you must idealize your parents because you're dependent on them or whoever's raising you. No kid can go, yeah, my grandmother's ill or my dad's poor or my mum's unhappily married. They just think, oh, they don't like me. I guess I'm not likable. And the problem is that when you buy into that, you keep that belief forever ever unless you get to see a great therapist who can in minutes undo all of that and make you realize that you are way more than enough i kind of free people from negative beliefs but it's much more than that a lot of people try and work out what i do and they always say you give people freedom and i do i free people from all their issues and make them feel great about themselves science has proven that something happens in the brain when you use hypnosis when you use my kind of transformational hypnosis something magical happens happens in the brain. The brain changes during hypnosis in a way that it cannot change out of hypnosis. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to install anything in you that's scary because of course I can only make you do what you want to do. Hypnosis is absolutely safe. It's actually mentioned in the Bible. In the Bible it says you will be transformed in the blinking of an eye, which is a form of hypnosis. I've never had once anyone claim on my insurance, touch wood, I've never had to use it. I've never had any situation that's been dangerous. The only thing people ever say to me on a regular basis is, wow, I've learned more in an hour with you than 10 years with my regular therapist, and I wish I'd known this years ago. I guarantee it's safe because it's so natural. You know, I'm talking to you and that can't be dangerous. I'm helping you, but I can only promise you it is absolutely safe and it's wonderful. Everything I have in my life, I owe to hypnosis. I wouldn't have my daughter if I hadn't hypnotized myself past that doctor saying I could never have one. I wouldn't have my beautiful marriage if I hadn't decided to change the belief that I was hideous and stupid. So to be hypnotized, I want you to make yourself very comfortable. I prefer you to sit back or lie back with your feet and hands not touching. The magic is that you roll up your eyes, keep your eyeballs up, close the lids down. And if you do that, you'll find that straight away you go into what's called REM, rapid eye movement. You only get REM when you're dreaming or going into hypnosis because it means you're in a deeply suggestible state. So I want you to rehearse with me. Just look up as high as you possibly can, as if you're trying to look into your own eyebrows. Fix your eyes at a real or imagined spot overhead and keeping your eyes glued to that real or imagined spot, just breathe in and breathe out. And the trick is to keep your eyeballs up, but at the same time, just close the lids down. So just 
rehearse that. Just make sure you're lying or sitting where you can't be disturbed with your feet and hands not quite touching. And I want you to roll your eyeballs up so that you feel as if you're looking or trying to look into your very own eyebrows. And fixing your eyes at a real or imagined spot overhead, just breathe in and breathe out. And again, breathe in, breathe out. And just one final time, breathe in, keep your eyeballs up, but at the same time, just close your eyelids right down, all the way down, and as your eyelids shut down, you can forget all about the position of your eyeballs now. And you can just allow a drifting, floating feeling to develop in your body. And I want you to tilt your chin just a fraction so you get that same looking down feeling that you might get as you look over a balcony or down a flight of stairs, you're looking down 10 steps. And as I count backwards, you're going to see your feet, hear your feet, even feel your feet treading each step. You're moving on to step 10 right now as each muscle. Every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You're taking step 9. And you can hear your feet making contact with each step. You're taking step eight. You can see your feet touching each step as you go deeper. You're taking step seven. You can feel your feet treading each step as you go deeper still. You're taking step six as each muscle. Every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You're taking step five, you're halfway down. As each muscle, every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You're taking step four as you gently, calmly, easily move on over to an even deeper level. You're taking step three as every sound and noise around you carries you deeper and further into hypnotic sleep, a sleep that is quite different to the kind of sleep you take at night. You're taking step two, just drifting way down deep. You're taking step one, just go deeper, drift deeper, sink deeper. And as you go deeper right now, your subconscious mind is ready to pick up, to accept, to absorb every word I'm saying. As you relax and absorb these words, you are so aware that you have a strong desire and a compelling ability to become slimmer and leaner. And this desire and ability is becoming such a powerful part of you that it overrules any old desire to eat destructively and instead you are constantly motivated to act in ways that cause you to become and remain at your ideal way, to become trimmer, healthier, younger, fitter, more attractive. You only want to eat healthy, fresh food. You exercise and you look and feel younger. And you know that you were born with a perfect body and with a perfect attitude to food. As a baby, you were so in tune with your body that you knew when to eat and, of course, when to stop eating. And you are able to reactivate and reclaim that ability through the power and direction of your inner mind. As a baby, you knew that you would always have another day to eat, that food would always be available to you. And you know that now, and you easily leave food. You say no to the wrong food with ease. You're becoming more and more in tune with your body, working together as a perfect team. You respond to your body by eating healthy, nutritious food that allows your cells to work perfectly, to repair damage, to slow down aging. And your body responds by becoming lighter, leaner, healthier, younger. You are so aware that you have a right to be slim and fit and active. You have a drive and a commitment to be slim. And every day you feel motivated and conditioned to eat differently, to feel different about food. You see food as fuel for your body and for your cells. And you only want to eat the food that your body can use. 
You're freeing yourself forever from destructive, self-defeating eating habits. There is simply no room in your mind, in your body, in your life for destructive eating. From now on, overeating is something you used to do, and it just cannot, will not, and does not influence you any longer. Because every day you move on from one great achievement to another. You eat differently. You become leaner. You have so much more energy. You exercise willingly. And you love the feeling of fitting into smaller clothes and feeling such a sense of accomplishment and achievement. You have decided to change your weight, your shape, and your size. And you so easily take all of the action that makes this happen. You're erasing, eliminating, and eradicating negative, poor eating habits forever. You just find yourself refusing to eat junk, refusing to overeat, refusing to eat the food that would only harm your body. You love your body, and because you love your body, you want to take care of it, and you treat it with respect. You choose healthy food, and you automatically eat less. So just see yourself in your mind at your ideal weight. Feel how slim you are. Hear other people praising you on your achievement. Notice how much happier your body is now that you respect it. You like it and you want to do things that keep it in a healthy, attractive state. So make an image of how you want to look and tell your mind that this is what you want. This is what you really, really want to look the way you look in that image. And as you focus on this image every day, you're already moving towards it because your mind is picking up that your strongest desire, your most compelling, motivating desire is to reach and maintain your ideal size and shape and weight. You are now and forever a selective, moderate eater. Those old negative habits are fading, shrinking, they are long gone, leaving you free to eat in a healthy, natural way, leaving you slimmer, more vital, more attractive, so much more youthful. Your mind, the most powerful healing force there is, is freeing you from old negative habits. You are moving so far away from emotional eating, from overeating that you can feel it and sense it leaving you, shrinking, disappearing, going, gone. As you eat differently, your body is becoming a super-efficient fat-burning machine. It uses all the healthy calories that you take in to build a perfect body for you. You nourish your cells with natural food, with lean protein, with vegetables. Your metabolic rate is increasing through the power and direction of your subconscious mind. So just feel, believe, and imagine your metabolic rate working perfectly, as perfectly as it did in your childhood. Your stomach is shrinking. Your stomach is actually the size of your own fist, so begin to squeeze your fist right now. And while squeezing your fist, just repeat to yourself over and over again in your head. My stomach is the size of my fist. My stomach is the size of my fist. And as you say that, you can notice your stomach is shrinking. It's becoming smaller right now. And as you concentrate on this feeling, it's increasing through the power and direction of your mind. Your stomach is becoming small, tiny. You find yourself eating enough food to satisfy the capacity of your fist and then you stop easily, you stop willingly because you want to. You have a small, tiny, shrunken stomach. You eat slowly and you feel full quickly. From now on, you only eat in response to real hunger. You are now and forever a sensible, selective eater. You drink a lot of water every day to assist your body in eliminating excess weight. You crave water. You drink eight glasses a day. Your skin is glowing. You look and you feel fabulous. You leave some food at every meal because you feel full quickly. You eat slowly 
and you just love that feeling of choice. You leave a little something, it makes you feel so powerful and so healthy. Food can never control you. You are taking charge of how you eat, how you look, how you feel. And leaving a little something proves that to you. You have such a positive attitude to your body. You have an overwhelming ability to become and to stay slim. You know that if your body needed excess food, it wouldn't turn it into excess body weight. Excess food is wasted wherever it goes. You refuse to treat your body as a rubbish bin. You leave excess food, you throw it away. It thrills you, it delights you, it empowers you. It elates you to throw away excess food because you know that overeating is punishing to your body. Your body and your cells hate being overworked with too much food. You know that sugar is your enemy. It ages your skin. It makes your body store fat and you become so indifferent to sugar. It thrills you, it delights you, it empowers you, it elates you to say no to sugar. And you do this all the time. You do this easily, automatically, you continuously say no to sugar. And of course you say yes to looking and feeling young. You say no to sugar and yes to looking amazing. You choose to do this, but you also choose to feel great about it too. When you're offered sugar and you refuse it, you feel good about that because you love your body and your body loves you right back and it's becoming more and more the way you want it to be. And as you do this wonderful thing for your body, saying no to sugar and yes to eating selectively, your body in turn does so many wonderful things for you. You look and feel amazing. Every day, you are nourished, filled, and satisfied by the good feelings you have about yourself. And every day your appetite is changing in the most perfect way. You need less nourishment from food because you are emotionally nourished. You eat less, but you enjoy the food so much more. You eat slowly. You eat less, and you always choose lean, nutritious, and healthy food that your body easily digests and uses. And as you eat in this healthy, wonderful way, your body uses every perfect calorie to rebuild and to rejuvenate you. And you become leaner, slimmer, radiantly healthy. You look younger, fitter. Your clothes look so much better on you. And because you feel so good about yourself, you exercise. You treat your body with absolute love and respect. You easily reach a body weight that is right and appropriate for you. Eating healthy food and exercising is becoming such a fundamental, integral part of you. It's a part of who you are. It's another way of you being good to yourself, reclaiming a positive self-image, loving yourself. It is so natural for you to eat healthy food because you're using your power of choice to choose how you're going to feel and how you're going to look. You've chosen to eat differently. You have chosen to become slimmer easily, permanently, to take all the action that makes this happen. So I want you to see this right now. See and feel your stomach is smaller and flatter. Your legs are leaner, your waist is smaller because you have made up your mind and set your mind to reach and maintain your ideal weight. And I want you to see yourself going into a shop, buying clothes in your ideal size, wearing them looking amazing, and you know there is no food in the world, there is nothing you could eat ever that will give you that wonderful feeling of taking anything off the rails in your size, and it fits you like a glove. And each of these words are making a deep, vivid, permanent, powerful impression on your subconscious mind. Every single day you are becoming aware of the full, powerful effect these words are having on you. The healing power of your own mind is strengthening, perfecting your ability to change your weight, 
and your eating habits forever. And as you absorb these words, you are reinforcing your mind, replacing every single negative belief with a new constructive one. You are reactivating, re-manifesting and regenerating that perfect attitude to food that you were born with. It is coming back to you, staying with you forever. And my voice is going with you, staying embedded in you, having a permanent, powerful and all-pervasive healing effect on you right now. So whenever you listen to this recording in bed at night before sleep, you can now simply drift into a deep healing sleep that will carry you right through until the morning. And you'll take in everything I've said and you'll return to your full awareness in the morning quite normally. But if you're playing this recording during the day, then on the count of one, you can slowly, calmly, easily return to your full awareness on the count of two, feeling at ease. On the count of three, feeling wonderful, feeling revitalized, feeling restored. On the count of four, feeling fully aware. On the count of five, just open up your eyes. Just take a deep breath. The reason diet pills don't work is because overeating is a habit of action that is run by a habit of thought. So compulsive eating, binge eating, that's a habit of action. But what's running that is a thought process. No one ever says, you know, I binge on lettuce or once I start eating celery, I just can't stop. In my 30 years, people say to me, I can't stop eating cookies. Once I open a packet of potato chips, I can't stop. I can eat a whole tub of ice cream and then open a second one. So this is a habit of action, but it's run by a habit of thought. When you change the thought process, you're cured forever. So if you've ever been made to eat something like kidneys or liver or sprouts or semolina and found it disgusting, you can never eat it again because you changed your habit of thought. Some people say, you know, one of my friends is saying that she started to keep chickens for eggs and now she can't eat chickens ever because she's kind of in love with these chickens. So she's changed her habit of thinking. When you change your habit of thinking, the action goes away forever. If anyone here has ever been over the toilet bringing up mushroom risotto or prawns, they'll go, oh, I can't eat that again for the rest of my life. And even though they actually want to eat it later, they'll find they just can't because when you change a habit of thought, you change the habit of action forever. Diet pills don't touch your thinking. Diet pills suppress your appetite so you can't eat chocolate. But the minute you stop taking the pills, you go back to eating the chocolate. We know that diet pills have a massive failure rate. They suppress your appetite. And guess what? Whatever you suppress will eventually motivate you. So the more you starve yourself or suppress your appetite with pills, the minute you stop, you eat more than ever. And we know they don't work. And we know the side effects are terrible and can even be life-threatening. And why would you even bother when just changing your thinking would change your life? You know, no vegan wakes up and says, oh my God, today I must try really, really hard not to eat bacon or it's so hard not to eat those beef burgers at work. Their thought says, I can't eat a living creature. That isn't right or wrong. It's proof that you're not what you eat, you're what you think. And if you want to change the way you eat, if you want to be your perfect way forever, guess what? Change your thinking. It not only works, it works for the rest of your life. And one of the reasons I know it works is because it works for me. You know, when I was in my 20s, I couldn't keep chocolate in my house. I couldn't even keep jam or confectionery or cookies. I couldn't even keep bread or cereal in my house because I'd eat all of it. And now... I keep loads of that stuff in my house. I don't even look at it, I'm indifferent to it. And it, it's so liberating. But I didn't change what I did, I changed what I thought. And that changed my whole life. And it's gonna change all the people that come onto this program's life too, because it really works. One of the reasons my method works so incredibly well is because we are all born normal about food. When you were in your mother's womb, when my little baby was in my womb, food is available 24 hours a day. And babies are born with an interesting belief, and this is it. Food's always there, I have it later. You can never make newborns overeat. When they've had enough, they stop. You know, if I would give my stepchildren or godchildren, if they ask for an ice cream and I give it to them, 
they give it back after four bites. When I used to do my daughter's birthday parties, all the children go, I want a piece of cake, I want a piece of cake, I want a piece of cake. And they clamor for the cake and you hand out the paper plate with a cake. They take four bites and go off to play because their mindset says, that's always there. I'll have it later. And that's a good thing. And you'll find that naturally skinny people will have half a packet of candy in their handbag or they'll have dishes of potato chips on their counter and don't eat them because their belief is it's always there. When you start to go, this is naughty food and this is bad food and I mustn't eat it, guess what happens? You increase the desire. So the more you try to resist something, the more you want it. And the more you get into this mindset, I mustn't have that and I can't have it, your body now starts to make you really, really want it. So we know that dieting doesn't work. In fact, science has proved that diets have a 2% success rate which means, guess what, they have a 98% failure rate. We know the most time anyone can stay on a diet is six weeks, and that's optimistic. So what my program does is it reactivates what you were born with, an ability to leave food. I've never met a two-year-old that goes, I ate two biscuits, yes, I've got to run around the nursery today and burn off that fat, or today I must try really hard not to eat candy. So it gives you back something amazing, an ability to be indifferent to food. The opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference and disinterest. And then you can be around cupcakes and cookies and just think, yeah, I'll have those when I'm 65 or 75 or 85. What my program really does is it, it sets up a dialogue with your mind. So, for instance, this bride wrote to me and said, you know, I, I've been trying to lose weight. I've got this dress. It's too small. And I thought I'd go on a diet and get thinner. And I'm actually getting fatter every week. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do because I can't get it on it. It doesn't fit me. And I haven't got enough money to buy another one. And I said, well, what happened? She goes, well, every time I go to the store, I go to the biscuit aisle. I look at my favorite cookies and go, oh, I love you. You're my favorite. I'm just going to buy you and eat one. And then, of course, she eats the whole packet. And so I said, okay, so next time you go to the cookie aisle, you look at the cookie and you go, you are nice. I do like you, but I like fitting into my dress way more. And I've got one day to look amazing in this dress. I've got 50 years to eat these double chocolate Dutch cookies. Anyway, she said that was so effective. She didn't buy them. She fitted into the dress. She looked amazing. And she said it was really weird because after the wedding and the honeymoon, I went to the store to buy them. I went up to them and I just thought, no. I'm so over you. I don't even want you anymore. And she said it was amazing that the dialoguing took away the desire. So saying, I mustn't have you is like saying, I mustn't scratch my nose. The more you say it, the more you think about it. But saying, I could have you. When I'm 95, I might have loads of you. But right now, I am choosing to look amazing in my clothes. So it sounds kind of weird that you change your thinking, but I still do that. When people come up to me and go, oh, here's some candy, I go, looks nice, but doesn't look as nice as when I get on the scales every day, and I'm always my perfect weight. So my brain understands. I don't fight to resist food. I did. From 14 to 30, I was always starving, binging, binging, starving, denying myself stuff, punishing myself, and then eating masses of it. And it's fair to say that I was consumed by food. I'd always wake up and think, oh, I wish I hadn't eaten that, or I shouldn't have eaten that, or today I'm not going to eat that. And it is a form of torture, and now I just wake up and I have what I want, but I've got my brain to want really nice, healthy food. I have no interest in a Krispy Kreme donor. I would have done once, but um, it's a great ability to make your mind indifferent to stuff and to understand that your body doesn't even want it. Your body never goes, yay, I want colorants, chemicals, preservatives, pesticides, junk. That's your mind. And it's a mindset you had when you were five or six or seven, which is why people go, oh, when I'm down, I want pizza or... I want cookies or I want cereal. No one ever said, when I'm down, I want a bit of grilled trout with some wilted spinach on the top. That would never work because we have taste receptors. And they, when you're a little baby and your mum picks you up and feeds you milky, creamy, fatty, sweet milk, it meets every need you have. You feel loved, you feel significant, you feel connected. And whenever you're out of sorts, your mind goes, I know eat something like children's food and it'll make you happy but when you weigh 500 pounds it doesn't make you happy I mean I have clients who 
eat like cheesecakes in tears because they're so obese. But, and eating it is making them cry, but they're still eating it because the, the body doesn't want it, but the mind is stuck in this loop. That makes me happy. I need to eat it. I've eaten it now. I'm unhappy. I'll eat some more of it. And now I'm even more unhappy. But what perfect weight forever does is like, oh yeah, I could have that, but I'm choosing not to. And the weight's dropping off me and hey, I'm really happy. And guess what? I can even have it in the house for my kids and I'm just indifferent to it. And it's really nice to have the freedom to just eat normally like nature wanted you to eat. So I've had clients fly me all over the world to get them in shape for their wedding, for a film they're in, for a rock concert they're performing in. And I've always helped people to lose weight and become slimmer, but I've never really been able to help people individually, which I love doing. I mean, occasionally I'll meet someone at an airport who'll come up and they might ask me a question. And if I've got 10 minutes, I'll help them. But it's a, a lovely thing that now, because of modern technology, I can help everybody. So what the program does for you, it's rather like having a personal session with me. The program is going to ask you some questions. How old were you when you thought you were heavy? How old were you when you couldn't leave food or when food started to control you? And it's going to identify what was going on with you. And then when it's identified what's going on with you, it's going to cure you. You see, a lot of diets do this. We're all addicted to food or we all eat emotionally. There are at least six types of overeaters. There's emotional overeaters, angry overeaters, destructive overeaters, habitual overeaters, and ignorant overeaters too, who aren't ignorant, but their beliefs about food certainly are. And you cannot do a one-size-fits-all. Like you'll see that a lot of men eat very differently. Most men don't go, oh, I need ice cream, I need cookies. They think I need a burger and fries and pizza and beer. And so what I've done is identified all the different types, six to eight types of overeaters. And I'm going to talk to you and identify immediately, it's really simple, what type of overeater you are. And then, even better, I'm going to cure you. So it's like having a personal session. You have a download, you listen to it. The download will get your mind to show you what happened because we all come onto the planet normal about food and you just listen to it. It's not scary, it's really nice. And the download will simply have you remember. For instance, I had a grandmother who loved me. But every time I saw her, she'd make cakes and candy and give me chocolate. And eventually I would walk in her house and the minute I opened the door, she'd open the cake tin. It was like this synchronicity. And eventually I couldn't even get in her house without wanting cakes. And every time I saw her, I wanted cakes. And then whenever I was unhappy, I could eat so many cakes. Because she didn't mean to, but she trained me to see cakes were love. So if I wasn't getting love, I'd eat cakes. And then I got fat and then I definitely wasn't getting any love. So that didn't work. So what it will do for you is that it will show you how, where, why you went from being normal about food to not. And then it will show you exactly how to cure that. And it really is a cure. And it will give you some little things to think. And the thing I love the most about my program, it isn't work. You know, I look at some programs, they go, okay, you know, write out 100 affirmations or do 600 sit-ups or make all these diet salads and chop up lettuce. That, that's really work. I want you to change instantly while you're listening to the download. And I want it to be easy because it's so easy for me. So it's going to take you through a process where you discover very quickly how this happened. And I'm a great believer that understanding is power. The minute you understand how and where and why, then you are already empowered to fix it. And then it does fix it. It tells your brain different things. You'll always have another day to eat cookies. You're able to look at pizza and go, no thanks, not really into that. And it really works. And then you become your perfect way forever. And it's a real win-win because, I mean, my methods are kind of magical and new and very different and innovative. But really it's giving you back what you were born with. I spend a lot of time in Africa. You see lions, they kill a wild beast, but when they've had enough, they walk away. They don't binge on it. They don't eat again for a day and a half because their brain's like, yeah, I've had enough now. Whereas we like, okay, I've had some ice cream, but I need more. And we can't leave food because food companies have done a lot of damage. They kind of have brainwashed people. 
You know, they say on Pringles, but you can't eat just one. Imagine if they said that in a bottle of whiskey. We'd be outraged. Um, and they make you believe that you can't leave food, you can't have this one. We call candy bars heaven, divine, love, heroes, celebrations. You are being brainwashed to believe that that food makes you happy, happy, happy. And the more junky, chemically full of sugar it is, I mean, McDonald's call their food Happy Meals. Some confectionery companies call their candy bars fun size. That isn't a mistake. A lot of money goes into brainwashing you to want junk food when you're unhappy. And actually, what I've done is exactly the same thing, but I'm brainwashing you not to want it. And it's really effective. But the nicest thing is that it is so permanent and it isn't work. It just works. A lot of people say, I don't know what you've done. Um, like Anna on Super Size, Super Skinny, what have you done to my brain? I'm looking at all this bread, it looks nice, but I can't eat it. So I was on a plane recently and the stewardess was giving me chocolate. I said, I don't eat chocolate. She went, oh, I wish I could do that. And I said, well, I didn't always do that, but now I don't eat. I mean, I do eat it sometimes, which is so lovely because I can eat a bit and leave it for months. I could never do that once. But it's such a great freedom to go, yeah, I don't eat that, or I'll have that another time or later. So it will do for you everything you want and so much more. And of course, it's a real win-win because then you love your body. And when you love your body, you don't really want to eat a whole packet of taco chips. You want to eat better food. And people go, oh, isn't it really expensive to eat healthy food? No, it really isn't. It's actually cheaper than eating all that junk. And you feel better and you look younger too. Your skin looks great. You have energy. You get to go and hang out at the pool with your kids. I think, oh God, I feel really fat. And it's just nice. You get to really like your body and want to look after it instead of punishing it with stuff that it doesn't want, never asks you for and hates, but that your mind is in a loop with thinking it makes me happy, even though you know it makes you really unhappy. Because it's an audio program that you just put into your ears, it's so easy because you can put it on while you're commuting to work. You can put it on when you're on the train, on the bus. You can put it on when you're in the bath. You can put it on when you're lying in bed. You can put it on when you're walking around the house. You can even go for a walk and have it on. You don't have to take time out of your day to watch a video. It's an audio program. And the audio program takes you back to negative patterns and cures them. And then it just repeatedly tells you how normal you are about food, how easy it is for you to leave food. And it actually makes you feel delighted to leave food. It makes you feel really powerful, you get very quickly that food can never control you. And you just listen to it, and everyone has 15 minutes to listen to something. And of course, it isn't one audio program. We give you a whole selection. We give you different audio programs, not too many. We give you four to six, because you have a bit of variety and you can change them around. And of course, again, different people have different eating issues. But you just put it on your iPad or your phone and listen to it. And it works. And the other thing is, it can work instantly. People say, how will I know? Well, lots of my clients will say, you know, I, I saw you. I left. I went into the garage to get some candy, the petrol station. And I came out of the bottle of water and was like, what was that all about? Because often it works instantly. You know, one of my clients said, you know, it's so weird. If they give me a coffee and it has the bit of chocolate, I have to send it back. I cannot even look at chocolate. One of my other clients was saying that for a while she couldn't make her daughter sandwiches because she became so averse to bread and I had to rework her with that so she could make them for other people. So it, for many people it works instantly and also you'll see results really, really quickly. You'll see from the testimonials how fast it can work. And again, I say this a lot because it's true, it never wears off, ever. There is some hypnosis in the program and, and some people are very scared of hypnosis because they think someone else is controlling their mind and it's really not like that. Perfect weight is not me taking over your mind and controlling it. It's just giving you what you want to have. So perfect weight forever is so much more than a hypnosis. It's what I call almost rewiring your mind to be normal about food, reprogramming, reconditioning your mind to leave food, reactivating and remanifesting that ability you were born with. But it's not about someone else controlling you, waving a swinging watch and making you feel that you have no power. If anything, it's empowering you and it's not going to send you to sleep, 
but it is going to wake you up wake you up to normal eating and, and having your perfect weight forever and having some energy. So it's not going to send you to sleep or anything freaky or crazy or scary. It's going to wake you up to being normal about food the way you're meant to be for the rest of your life. And you'll love it. I've been known for getting phenomenal results with my clients in one session. I'm known for that. Therapists send me the clients they can't get. Doctors and psychiatrists send me the clients they can't cure. And I'm known for taking the most difficult person and turning them around in an hour. You think has a physical reaction. When men see a very sexual image, they have a very physical reaction to a thought. When we see pictures of food on screen, we start to create digestive enzymes. So we know that every thought you think has a physical reaction and an emotional response and we know now for instance in England when doctors are performing surgery they're not allowed to say anything like oh this is a nightmare or this is a disaster they can't say it because they know that even under anesthesia the mind picks up stuff you know we know that children pick up stuff and the mind is rather like a child it just believes everything it hears so it's very important to make sure your mind hears extraordinary things and believes them and then you can have have an extraordinary life because you have a choice when you have a brilliant brain here's your choice rationalize why you feel so bad or talk yourself out of it I'm going to show you how to talk yourself out of it so effectively that it isn't even what you do it's who you are it will change your life